Hello and welcome to the Midgar Press. My name is Jay. So we are going to start covering the adventures. Um, we've covered the rules. We've gone through the rule book. We have gone through the bestiary at the end of the rule book. We have gone through the bestiary within the adventures book, the book that we're going to be looking at now. I figured it was appropriate and time for us to finally go through the adventures themselves. Uh, now, currently at this moment, I've only ran through half of the adventures in person um, or even online digital, but um, there's still half that I have not played. Uh, so as we're going through this, I will mention which ones I have, which ones I haven't. So, you know, if, if I miss a thing or two, you know, don't get at me, but this is, uh, this is the full page layout in the adventures book and it shows the different adventures. So we've got the opening scene, we've got outskirt, we've got deadfall breach, Ritter mound, Bothold's load. Oracle Cave, Troll Spire, Fort Malice, the Isle of Mist, Temple of the Purple Flame, the Village of the Day Before, Tower of Size, Roads End Inn, and then Dead Eyes Cave. And there's, I mean, just look at this map. I love this map. I really do. Every time I look at it, it's just like there's something else in here that I don't see or I haven't seen before. And there's just so much detail in like little spots all throughout it. It's just fantastic. It really is. Um, absolutely love it. So um, before we get into... Uh, the opening scene, because that's what we're going to cover first. We're going to go through the history. This episode will be dedicated to the history, the current situation, and kind of if you are playing like the actual campaign for Ritter or uh, for the Misty Veils for um, Dragon Bane, you know, kind of what your intentions should be, where you should be going, what you should be doing, kind of leading your party. So, history. Um, a thousand years ago, the vile demon Sothmog came to our world. His prophet was a village priest named Azeroth Koth. I know I said that wrong, y'all. I know. The demon whispered dark secrets in his ear until his magic grew so powerful that he could open a rift between the worlds and allow his dark master to take physical form. With Koth as his herald, Sothmog proclaimed a demonic realm in the world of humans that lasted two centuries. It was a time of darkness and evil, but also one of incredible rapid human expansion at the expense of the elder kin dwarves elves giants and halflings as time passed the opposition of or opposition to sothmog grew until one day a young hero named and i've i've i know i've said this wrong before eliden Eladdin? It's not Aladdin. Eladdin. Eladdin. Yeah, we're going to go with Eladdin. That's what we're going to do. Uh, and I'll probably mention it wrong again because it's just one of those words that gets me. Um, but Eladdin managed to summon the ancient dragons charged with guarding the world from demonic influence, mounted on dragon back with the elder kin as his allies. Eladin finally defeated the demon. The beast was banished up or banished on a hill in the depths of the forest, but the final act he cast a curse, which he said would spread a sickness throughout the world and one day be its undoing. Koth was captured, but his 
but since his master had made him immortal, Elodin's knights could not slay him, no matter how hard they tried. Instead, he was imprisoned in a crypt under an island in a lake in a remote valley. Guarded by warriors, sentenced to remain at their post until the end of their days. <clears throat> Got a little thirsty. Elodin's empire. <clears throat> so, after the demons had ruled for two centuries, Elodin has brought his empire in. <clears throat> Elodin founded a new empire based on the worship of dragons and their cleansing fire. <laughs> cleansing only because they destroy everything it hits. His realm expanded cities, or his realm expanded, cities were built, and paved roads spread throughout the wilderness. Soon the elder folk grew weary of humanity's advance, and many left. The dwarves burrowed themselves into the mountain and built a new realm underground in the autumn of his life. Elodin started to distrust and fear the dragons who had carried him to victory against Sothmog. To secure his power, the dragon emperor sacrificed part of his soul to forge Umdurman, a magical sword with the power to slay dragons and demons alike. Finally, the humans would be free and independent of uh, primal beings. When Elodin eventually passed away, the sword was hidden in a crypt as the dragon priest believed the weapon to be too dangerous to be used except in extreme emergencies. Opening the crypt required a special key. A, a uh, statue that split into four pieces, one for each direction ruled by the Dragon Emperor, because the Misty Vales was 150 kilometers north, southeast, west. <clears throat> so anyways, um, after Elodin's death, a power struggle broke out between his sons, and the empire took a tyrannical turn. All protests against the Dragon Knight's rule were severely uh, punished, and the realm was beset by strife. Finally, the dragons turned their back on the empire, which collapsed shortly thereafter. Savage orcs invaded much of the region, and many humans were forced into exile. All that remained from Elodin's reign were the fading words of monks and knights who continued to worship the Immaculate Flame. But legend has it that part of the Dragon Empire served across the sea in the Far East. Now, we don't have a map other than the Misty Veil. Vale. So, when, he's, when they say there at the end that the legend is part of the Dragon Empire survived, but across the sea in the Far East... We have no idea where that is. No idea. Um, anyways, <clears throat> let's get back over to here. Uh, Koth. Centuries passed, and the stories of Sothmog, Elodin, and Umdurman became myth and legend. Both Sothmog did not forget. Or, but Sothmog did not forget. Of course he didn't. He's a demon. He's eternal. Trapped between the worlds, he dreamed of revenge, and his growing anger made him stronger. 800 years after his banishment, the demon had grown powerful enough to awaken his servant, Koth, from his magical slumber. His demonic influence turned his captors into undead thralls who ventured into the Misty Vale and forcefully recruited living souls into Koth's growing band of servants. Koth could still not leave his prison, so he had summoned monstrous beasts, and his power spread across the region. 
His evil affected nature itself, and a thick mist settled over the valley. The orcs in the area feared these demonic forces and decided to leave, which cleared the way for the humans and other kin to repopulate the region, unaware of the myth's origin. Several of these humans fell under Sothmog's demonic influence. Koth's goal is to become free and then to let Sothmog into the world once more. Defeat the dragons once and for all, and reestablish his master's rule. So the current situation. It says, <clears throat> A decade has now passed since humans started returning to the Misty Vale. As they call it, as they call it due to the thick haze that covers the valley. <clears throat> Drawn by rumors and legends of hidden riches and lost knowledge from the old dragon-worshipping empire. <clears throat> Equally significant was the was that the dwarves of the Kumar Mountains, who for centuries had have traded with human settle settlements, reported that ferocious orcs who long dominated the Misty Vale seemed to be withdrawing. Many adventurers fastened swords to their belts and made their way to the myster mysterious valley. But settlers with pickaxes and ox-drawn carts were also attracted to the legendary site. Outskirt Village. The village of Outskirt emerged as a result of the influx of humans in recent years. It is a humble settlement of 50 or so newly built houses clustered around an old temple ruin. There are roughly 200 permanent residents, most of them are humans, as well as many adventurers, hunters, and other wanderers who use the settlement as a base for the journeys in the Misty Vale. The inhabitants of Outskirt are bold and adventuresome, filled with a pioneering spirit and determination to retake the Vale and all its hidden secrets and riches. But only a few know that the settlement rests on the ruins of the ancient temple that once was the heart of the Draconic Empire. The final resting place of the sword of um, Derman. So the dragon statuette. <clears throat> Many adventurer, unwary adventurers in the Misty Vale fell victim to Koth's power and his cultists quickly grew in number. When he heard the legend of Omdurman, the demon sorcerer, realized that the sword could kill him, but that it was also the key to his freedom and a mighty weapon against the dragons. Koth knows that Omdurman is buried beneath the temple, ruin in Outskirt Village, that it takes a special key to unlock the entrance. The statuette of black volcanic stone that depicts the former dragon emperor, Elidin. According to ancient writings, the statuette has been split into four pieces. One for each direction ruled by Elidin, which must be assembled in order to open the gate to Umdurman. Now, before we go into the demon cultists, this symbol right here that's, that's drawn... That is actually the symbol of um, like Koth's followers. It's the um, depiction that you're a demon cultist, basically. Um, <clears throat> so the demon cultist. Koth has many corrupted servants looking for the four-piece statuette. One of them was Dregel or Weatherman. The dying cultist whom the player characters encounter in the opening scene of the campaign, page 11. Weatherman found a piece of the statuette in the Kumar Mountains just before the start of the adventure, and on his way back to deliver it to his master. Another cultist, Lorana, costs eyes and ears and outskirt. She can act as a source of information and quest giver for the player characters, but also serves as Koth's spy and assassin. Read more about Lorana on page 15. She actually, she she really does. She plays as the, the devil's advocate where she works for Koth, but she also works with the players. Um, all demon cultists in the Misty Vale have been, have 
the black mark of Sothmog, branded somewhere on their bodies, usually on their forearm, hidden under the clothes. The mark is stylized demon's head with two sharp horns, just like this right here. So you got the head and the two sharp horns. <clears throat> so now we have the orcs. Koth is not only the one looking for the sword, um, Derman. The presence of his demonic servants have caused the valley's orcs to become concerned, and several clans have banded together under Chieftain Maladuk to drive out the followers of Sothmog. Maladuk knows that the legend of Umdurman and realizes that Koth will never be defeated if he gets his hands on the ancient weapon. The chieftain has withdrawn uh, with her elite warriors to await the final battle, but has also sent orc patrols and goblin wolf riders to track down the four pieces of the statuette. All creatures who serve Maladuk will have the mark of two crossed meat hooks burned into their right shoulder. And it just has like a little thing about sunlight due to the thick haze covering the misty veil. Orcs and goblins can move freely outdoors in the daytime without suffering damage. Uh, the Keepers of the Immaculate Flame, a third faction looking for the statuette in Umdurman, is the Keepers of the Immaculate Flame, a religious order of monks and knights who worship the Dragon Emperor Elodin. They see themselves as heirs of the ancient Dragon Knights and seek to reestablish Elodin's empire based on the principle of the cleansing fire. The Keepers of the Immaculate Flame abhor demons, particularly Sothmog, who, whom their scripts describe as the root of all evil. Uh, their goal is to find Umdurman and bring the sword for safekeeping to the head of their order beyond the Misty Veil. What not even the order knows is that Koth's return has caught the attention of the ancient dragons of the Dragon Fang Peaks. So <clears throat> this is what the statuette looks like when it's put together. Um, <clears throat> So that would be a statuette of the Dragon Emperor, Elodin. Uh, the four-piece statuette. The statuette of Emperor El uh, Elodin is roughly half a meter tall and is sculpted from black volcanic rock. It depicts a warrior, emperor, in full plate armor and a great helm with an ornate draconic visor. On the top of the helmet is the same horn-like crown as those of the milestones in the Misty Vale. Elodin is holding a scepter in one hand and the other grasps a mighty longsword with the tip pointing down at the pedestal. The statuette is split into four pieces which are depicted on the large map of the Misty Vale. Each piece counts as a quarter of an item in the player's inventory. Uh, the first piece is the pedestal, the lower legs, and the bottom half, the uh, imperial longsword whose tip merges with the, the pedestal. The second piece consists of the statuette's thighs, waist, and left side of the torso, left arm, including the scepter. The right side of the torso, the right arm, and the upper right of the longsword make up the third piece of the statuette. The fourth and final piece is the head and its crowned helmet. The four pieces fit together perfectly. When placed against each other, they are drawn together as an invisible force can no longer be separated. The fully assembled statuette counts as a regular item, weight one, and radiates a pulse of heat from within. To open the entrance of Umdurman, the statuette must be placed in a purpose-built niche underneath or inside the village's old temple ruins, which is described in detail under location number eight in the chapter of Outskirt Village. Oh my gosh, so much to talk about. Um, so the course of events. So the secret of the Dragon Emperor is basically like the name that, that uh, uh, Free League gives 
for the campaign. So The Secret of the Dragon Emperor is a series of adventures set in the Misty Vale. The campaign has pre-written opening scene, which we'll talk about next episode, and a final where the adventurers will face Koth and his army of demonic servants in the maze beneath the Isle of the Mist. In between, the player's characters uh, may explore the valley and take on uh, the adventurers in any order. As GM, you'll decide... Uh, which adventures the four pieces of the dragon uh, statuette can be found. That means you also control how the campaign will be without steering the players in the particular direction, because you don't want to railroad them. You just want them to be able to go and do their thing. Um, it actually it actually comes with adventure cards. Um <clears throat> okay so i don't actually have those um cut out uh because i apparently did not print those and i don't have the box set yet so i can't really show you but i do have the digital version of the the adventure cards it basically just gives like the 13 different adventures with a little summary of what that is <sighs> um but it says the players should be free to choose which adventures they want to play, but you can influence the selection by informing them of a new adventure, a few adventures at a time. So give them like options. You do this by using adventure cards in the box. Each, each card contains a rumor about an adventure site uh, that can be relayed by a suitable NPC. We suggest that you give the, the players two to three rumors to choose from and add more as the campaign, as the campaign progresses. The story begins when the players, uh, player characters find a dying man on their way to the Misty Vale through the Drickmore Pass. Before drawing his final breath, the hands he hands them a bloodstained bundle and mentions that he calls the secrets of the Dragon Emperor. After the, afterwards, they are attacked by a patrol of goblins who have come for the bundle, which contains a piece of the statuette, the dragon statuette, or dragon emperor statuette. The dying man also has a map of the Misty Vale, which is actually very handy for the players. Um, I mean, trying to get the players to do something they don't know where to go, disastrous. Absolutely disastrous. Inconceivable. Uh, Outskirt Village. After the opening scene, the player characters arrive in Outskirt. The cultist, Lorana, tries to trick them into finding the missing statuette pieces for her. The player characters can also encounter uh, Shadowleaf from the Keepers of the Mac and Flame, the mystic Darnoth, and the others who know about the legend of the Dragon Emperor statuettes and other things within the valley. During the rest of the campaign, Outskirt will be an important place for the player characters, a place where they can return to recover between adventures, purchase gear, or seek information. This book, therefore, contains a detailed description of Outskirt, starting on page 14. Uh, so the small little box right here to the side, it says Ritter Mound, and basically, like, if you're not if you're not sure which adventure to start with, they recommend Rare Mound because it's relatively short, simple, and it's a good introduction to new players. Uh, you can decide if there's a piece to be found there or not. I love Ritter Mound. I know we've talked about it before, and I can't wait till we cover it because Ritter Mound is my favorite adventure. Um, well, I'm not going to talk about it right now. We'll talk about it later. So the legend of Umdurman. It is important that the char player characters hear the legend of Umdurman at an early stage. Have an NPC tell them the story below. Annabella, a.k.a. Lorana, will be a good choice, but other alternatives are Shadowleaf, Durnoth, Maladuk, or the She-Spider, Shakal. Shakaka. The legend is also found in the adventure card. So here it goes. 
The sword of Umdaman was forged by the Dragon Emperor Elidin 800 years ago, when the world was a battlefield for dragons and demons. It is the blade of life, made to maintain the balance between order and chaos. It is a weapon for the free and unbound against the ancient evils, but it is the wrong, but in the wrong hands, Umdurman becomes a weapon of tyranny, the instrument of demonic darkness or draconic fire. After Elodin's death, the sword was buried in a crypt that could only be opened with a special key, a statuette split into four pieces, one for each direction, under Elodin's rule. The, nor- the truth is that what is... T- today known as the Misty Vale, was the heart of Elodin's empire. The Umdurman's crypt is hidden underneath the old temple ruin in Outskirt Village, but opening the crypt requires the four pieces of the statuette. They have been missing for centuries, sought by Elodin's servants as well as the followers of the demonic prince Sothmog. They can likely be found somewhere among the ruins of the Misty Vale. And we continue on. It says, Um, Umdurman, having found all four pieces of the statuette, after many hardships and exciting adventures, the player characters can finally enter the crypt uh, under the temple ruin in Outskirt and get their hands on Um, Umdurman. This will likely involve a confrontation with Lorana and her lackeys. If the player characters succeed, each of them should be rewarded by a heroic ability of their choice. The Isle of the Mist. With Omdurman in their possession, the player characters can reach the Owl um, in the north and finally confront Koth. This is because the island is shrouded in a corrosive mist that can only be cleared by using the sword. Defeating the demon sorcerer will put a stop to Sothmog's evil plans for now. And earn each player another heroic ability of their choice. But will it also upset the balance between demons and dragons? So there's also demonic omens, which I haven't really played with yet because it's still very early in the uh, in-person and online campaign I'm running for Dragon Bane. But it says demonic omens. As Koth's power grows and the demonic influence of Sothmog increases, Strange and frightening omens start to appear in the Misty Vale. You can let the player characters witness the dark omens below when appropriate. Whether they are in outskirt or on the road, roll uh, on or choose from the table below. The effects end when Koth is defeated. So there's ten different things. <clears throat> um, One of the D10, Dark Clouds. So the mists over the valley thickens into a dense blanket of dark fog. What little light seeps through turns red and bathes the entire valley in a crimson light for one shift. Two of the D10, blood rain. A rain of blood or warm blood falls on the player characters. Everyone must must make a willpower roll to resist the fear. Three of the D10, mad prophet. A madman dressed in rags chants, The end is nigh, and the dark prince approaches. No one can get any sense out of him. For the D10, meteors. A rain of star stones falls over the valley of, in a fierce and terrifying downpour. The player characters must make a willpower roll to resist fear. 5. The Black Knight. On a distant hilltop, the player characters see a knight in black on a huge ho- uh, black horse, like a dark silhouette against the night sky. The knight rears his steed and vanishes. This is Sothmog's herald, but the only only the player characters can stop him now. Six of the D10. Reign of Frogs. Something hits the ground next to the player characters with a splat. Just as they see, it is a frog. The sky opens and releases a downpour of frogs upon them. 
along with or uh, anyone who fails to seek shelter suffers D6 damage. <laughs> Getting hit in the head by frogs. That's funny. Seven of the D10. Earthquake. Suddenly the earth starts shaking violently. The player characters are thrown to the ground and must make a willpower roll to resist fear. Eight. Locust Swarm. A buzzing cloud draws near, and the player character realizes it is a swarm of locusts devouring all vegetation in its path. Each player, each player character suffers a condition of their choice. Nine of the D10, Solar Eclipse. Even though it is in the middle of the day, the sun stops shining and an eerie darkness covers the valley for one stretch. The player characters must make a willpower roll to resist fear. Ten of the D10. Last one. The best one. Volcano. A thunderous rumble echoes from the dragon peak or dragonfang peaks, and the player characters see a plume of fire and smoke rising into the sky from a, a mighty mountaintop in the distance. Now, the way that I'm going to do this with the demonic omens is every time the player characters finish a adventure i will roll a d10 and then that will happen it will happen um <clears throat> either when they finish the adventure and they make their way back to town or they're going from one adventure to the next so either way after they def uh you know finish each adventure i'll roll a demonic omen omen all right. So, I know that was a lot to take in. Trust me. I've had to read that a couple times. Um, but it's a great setting. Like, it's a great setup for your player characters. You know, it's... Excuse me. It's just enough information and history to really get your players to be like, ooh, this could be something. Um... Because, you know, unlike other TTRPGs like D&D, &D, Pathfinder, Starfinder, you know, they just have so much lore. It's ridiculous. Thankfully, um, now this is like the, you know, eighth literation of Dragon Bane, Dragons and Demons and, you know, the whole thing. But this is the first edition the release from free league so free league is trying to do a whole thing okay they're giving us a little bit at a time which i appreciate i'm very thankful for so so yeah we'll go ahead and cover the opening scene next episode and then we'll cover the next one and next one next one so on and so forth we're going to go through the entire um adventures book okay so thank you all for if you're still here <laughs> thank you for listening uh, go ahead and hit the like button. Go ahead and hit the subscribe button. Hit the bell to get notifications. Go ahead and comment down below. What excites you about this setting? What what um, what could you see happening that could be a lot of fun? Actually, tell me which demonic omen you like the best. Let's do that. But until next time, my fellow nerds, my fellow friends and family and GMs alike, Game on and live on. Or is it live on and game on? Hmm.